Please stand as you're able. Behold the life-giving cross on which was hung the salvation of the whole world. Behold the life-giving cross on which hung the salvation of the whole world. Behold, the life-giving cross on which was hung the salvation of the whole world. We make our beginning tonight in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Please bow your head for a moment of silent reflection. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office, as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated.
Good evening. The Old Testament reading is from Isaiah chapter 52, verse 13, through chapter 53, verse 12. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them, they see, and that which they have not heard, they understand. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. And like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was put, cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his depth, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Good evening. The second reading is from Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, and chapter 5, verses 7 through 9. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who, were, who was able to save him from death and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. 
And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. This is the word of the Lord. His head, His hands, His feet, sorrow and love flow me down. Did air such love and sorrow? Oh, me. Oh. 
Oh, it demands my soul, my life, and my own love so amazing, so Demands my soul, my life, my own. Our Gospel reading this evening comes from the Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 10, beginning at verse 32. Please stand as you're able for the reading. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was going to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise and James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, guys. You may be seated.
Let us pray. Father, speak in this place. In the calming of our minds, in the longing of our hearts, by the words of my lips and in the thoughts that we form. Speak, O Lord, for your servants listen. Amen. Have you ever noticed how when people tell you directions, they tend to either use landmarks or science. The landmarkers are the ones who tell you what you can't miss. Just turn right at the big Walmart, you can't miss it. And then go down the street until you come to the big white fence. You can't miss it, they say. Then if you turn right, you'll see an old ranch house with a big oak tree leaning across the front yard. You can't miss it. Walmart's fences, big oak trees. These are the directions for landmarkers. On the other hand, you have the scientists. The trouble is, most times you may need a sextant and a slide rule to talk to them. Just go north on Bradley 3.3 miles until you reach Hampton. Then go west until you reach the 2100 block, and then bear a right 30 degree turn to the 500 feet later. Landmarkers and scientists. Either way, people seek to give you directions. But they, what they don't realize is that how they give directions creates a certain kind of following. For the scientists, 
you need at least a compass and street signs and a numbering system to arrive at a destination. But for the landmarkers, you only need to look around you to what's obvious, and then you can clearly find your way. Well, in his gospel, Luke, a physician by trade, has been rather specific in his approach. As he tells us about Christ's birth, he opens for us the world of kings and kingdoms. It was in the days of Caesar Augustus, while Quirinius was governor of Syria, that all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. It is Dr. St. Luke who tells us approximately when Jesus began his ministry. It was around the time of John the Baptizer, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being the governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of Iutera and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas. Luke, in telling us about the beginning of Jesus' ministry, has been scientific in his approach. And this creates a certain kind of following, because we recognize and can see and can research these events as part of human history. We read his gospel aware of the dynamics of the political situation of the known world. We can try to discern the division of the kingdoms, and the position and relative importance of the cities of the lands. But notice the difference tonight. When Luke moves to the crucifixion tonight, he begins to use landmarks. He points to creation, to the temple. What he tells us touches the very foundation of life on this earth and eternal life with God. He writes, It was now about the sixth hour. And there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. You don't need a map to the Holy Land to know what is happening at the crucifixion. You don't need to be able to tell the difference between a Caesar and a governor and a tetrarch. No, Luke uses what is obvious, so that anybody in the world can see what is happening and that all will believe in the graciousness of God. Some churches turn religion into a science. Turn on the TV and listen. You have your choice of religious systems. There are rules for living and promises for the future. If you just believe strongly enough, then God will bring healing. They'll tell you what to do with your money, how to dress, how to pray in the Spirit, And then you turn off the set or fire down your computer or put down your phone and you're still faced with the complexity of your life. There you sit with a teenage daughter who no longer talks to you when she comes home. Or you're with an ailing mother who struggles to live alone. Or you're stressed about a job that they're thinking of eliminating. And you wonder, now how can I make God work in the middle of this mess? We find ourselves caught up in all kinds of teachings and trying all kinds of activities until soon we begin to wonder whether there's a God at all. Faith becomes harder than finding Trachonitis on a map. And discouragement comes easily to a heart already weighed down with worry and with anxiety. Maybe you've come here tonight tired of trying to get God to work in your life. You've followed all sorts of rules. Your bookshelf has one too many books on how to have a happy marriage, too many apps or how, on how to fix yourself for that perfect relationship. Plus, you've stopped saying your prayers anymore before bed. You're just simply tired of the struggle, worn out by all the complexity. And deep down, you're afraid that maybe God truly isn't there. Listen to Luke tonight. Luke speaks tonight for all who have been lost in a religious system, whether it's the rules and regulations that we impose on our behavior, 
the Christian TikTok teachings, the politics of churches, or the promises of some evangelist on TV. If you've ever been lost, listen to Luke tonight. He points to something as important and central to religion as the temple. He says, to understand what is happening at this crucifixion, think about worshiping where a huge curtain separates the people from their God. When that temple curtain is ripped, you know something has happened. The way of worship has changed. God is no longer hidden from his people, needing to be reached by the blood of animal sacrifices. God does not need our religious activities, our works, our efforts to find him. He comes to us. And he forgives us by the death of his son. Here is God's simple love. On the cross, he opens the door to eternal forgiveness. Through the sacrifice of his son, God opens to you his heart. Jesus suffers the punishment of sin so that you will receive the love of God. Do you still need directions? Luke points to something as universal as creation. He says that to understand what is happening at this crucifixion, you simply need to have lived in a world where the sun rises in the morning and makes its way from one side of the sky to the other. When it is in the middle of the day and the sun is in the middle of the sky and it stops shining, you know something has happened. The way of the world has now changed. The power of darkness has come close to Jesus and for a moment, creation bows its head and closes its eyes. This is night in the middle of day like no other, when Jesus dies for a fallen creation. But then, there will be mourning like no other, when Jesus rises and brings about a new creation and a never-ending age. Jesus comes to you this night. He takes the wrath of God for you that you might awaken as a new creation yourself, where there you will never grow faint or weary, because for you, God is alive. But for those who need words, Luke offers one more landmark along the way. As Luke tells the story, there are many reaction to our, reactions to our Lord's death. The crowds beat their breasts. The women stand far off. And Joseph, a respected member of the council, Joseph of Arimathea, asks Pilate for his body. Yet in the midst of all these, you have one strange reaction. The Roman centurion. Listen to what he says when he sees our Lord's death. Luke writes, The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. Those are the only words that Luke records between the crucifixion and the resurrection. When the lips of Jesus are silent in death, Luke records one single voice. One voice in the face of deadly silence. You can't miss it. And what does Luke call it? He calls it a word of praise. That's what Luke writes. The centurion praised God. Praise is what happened whenever Jesus performed wonders. When the miraculous occurred, people opened their mouths and praised God. The shepherds in the field saw heavenly wonders, ran to see Jesus, and opened their mouths in praise. When Jesus raised a widow's child from the dead, their mouths were opened in praise. 
A leper was healed and ran back to Jesus. A blind man finally saw and took a good look at the Lord. Their mouths opened in praise. The miracles of Jesus led people to praise God. And now, when you would think that the time for miracles had passed, now when you would think that all the wonders are over, now when Jesus is dead on a cross, Luke records a sigh, a word, and a song of praise. And he does it because he wants you to see a wonder beyond all wonders. You see, God has made a marvelous exchange. In exchange for your sin, he has given you his righteousness. And in, in the place of all sinners, he has punished this righteous man. My friends, regardless of the complexities of your life, and they are complex. Regardless of your decisions and indecisions, regardless of how many books for the spiritual life that you have upon yourself, your shelf, one thing remains. The righteousness of Jesus saves you from eternal death. The cross has become for us a place of praise God looks at our lives, sees our sin, and yet chooses to call us righteous for the sake of his Son. This is his work, not ours. His obedience, not ours. His love, not ours. And his grace, not ours. Only one voice speaks, and it shares one simple truth. This was a righteous man, and by his righteousness, we are saved. Yes, we live in a world filled with complexity, the emotions of your daughter, the aging of your mother, the changing job market, the instability of your employment. In that complexity, it is easy for us to lose our focus. We try to balance our love for our children, our care for our parents, our love for our spouse, and our obligations at work. And in the midst of all this, we cannot find easy answers. We struggle. We do. We pray. We live truly. And we live sincerely. Yet often we falter and we lose our way. But as long as we live, and as long as we struggle, there is one thing that does not change. You can point to my sin, but I can point to my Savior. Jesus Christ, this righteous man who died on a cross. And if we should have any doubt, Luke has given all the directions anyone would ever need. The heavens, the temple, the curtain, and the people proclaim that here tonight on the cross is the glory of Christ. God has made this place, Golgotha, the place of the skull, a place of praise. Tonight, God opens the kingdom of heaven. In Christ, he forgives your sin. Take comfort in that certainty. Though our lives are complex, God has given us life in the death of his Son. And for this simple, saving love, we sing praise. And in his name, amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you this night and forever. Amen. And now before we receive our offering this evening, let us first share in a word of prayer. Let us pray. O God of the crucified Jesus, 
We are struck on this Good Friday by the brutal reality that Jesus knowingly, willingly, and obediently gave up his earthly life on a cross. He offered the ultimate sacrifice at Golgotha so that we may be redeemed by his blood. We now humbly give back to you these offerings tonight. These gifts are a mere gesture of sacrifice in comparison to Jesus' sacrifice for us. And yet, we give with the hope of being washed in his blood and in his name. Amen. God bless you in your offering this evening. The Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ. John 18, verses 1 to 11. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. When Jesus said to them, so he asked them again, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. 
So if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? Between each of these verses, we shall sing together verses 1 through 6 of O Sacred Head, Now Wounded, verse 1. John 18, beginning at verse 12. So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple, since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest, but Peter stood outside the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, You also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself, so they said to him, You also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it, and at once a cock crowed. Verse 2.
19, beginning at verse 28. Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled, but could eat the Passover. So Pilate went outside to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him, If this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. The Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not of this world. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. But you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Verse 3. John 19, beginning at verse 1. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die because he has made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me. 
Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement in Aramaic, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. Verse 4. Chapter 19, beginning at 16b. So they took Jesus, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but rather, This man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things. Verse 5.
John 19, beginning at verse 25. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Verse 6. John 19, beginning at verse 31. Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you also may believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Please join in singing with Olivia and Andrea. Were you there?
you there or oh, where the sun refused to shine were you there when the sun refused to shine oh, ooh, ooh, ooh. oh sometimes it causes me to tremble to tremble to tremble were you there when that sun refused to shine
Let us pray. We implore you, O Lord, that your abundant blessing may be upon all your people who have held the passion and death of your Son in devout remembrance. May we receive your gracious pardon, the gift of your comfort, and an increase in faith so that we may receive our eternal salvation. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.